This story happened many years ago. It wasn't too long after I became a Christian. Uh, what it was is that I was at a church, and it was my home church, and there was potluck, and things were going well. And so I, I went outside just to get a breath of air, and I see one of the church members walking around in the parking lot. I don't know if you've ever seen someone at a distance that is having some kind of health problem, but it's, it's kind of obvious that something's not right. And so that was the case for this lady. She was walking and kind of like going like this. And it's like, okay, so I walk up to her and ask what's wrong. She tells me that she's having an asthma attack and she had left her inhaler at home. So after some trying to figure out what's best to do, I decided, well, here, get in my car. Let's go home. Let's go to her house. We didn't get more than half a mile. Um, she couldn't, she stopped breathing in the car. It's just like, you know, pull over. And so she opens the door and the highway kind of looked like this with an embankment there. And so she opens the door and I didn't mention this, but she cannot feel her legs. Um, she had some type of spinal injury years back. And so she taught herself how to walk again without feeling her legs, incredible. Um, but it didn't work so well this time. So she tumbles down the embankment and ends up in the ditch. And now we're on a two lane highway. I get out, I'm like, well, now what do I do? Praise the Lord, the car that was behind us was a police car. And so he gets out, gets on his radio, whatever, ambulance comes, and we go to the hospital. Um, found out later what the cause was. She had drank some water. Um, the church water was bad. You did not want to drink it. Apparently nobody told her that, and so she took a drink of water and it triggered an asthma attack. What a difference a single drink of water can make. Now, why would I tell you this story? Um, when I first started studying the Bible, I ran across an illustration that has affected me ever since. And it's found in James. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? The difference between good water and bad water is that bad water has something extra. I mean, you can get water from the ground that is quite pure. We do it all the time. But you can also get water with something extra. And if you get that extra in you, it's not very good for you, much like my poor friend. Um, in Honduras, um, where we lived in Honduras, apparently was part of a, a volcano. It was a very volcanically active area. And so when we got water at our house, it was from a well drilled on site, and they put a pump down there to bring it up the water was so bad that it would corrode our stainless steel silverware, which isn't supposed to happen. So, you know, it would have been nice to have dug that well somewhere else, <laughs> if I could just be honest. Um, but seriously, bad water <clears throat> is really bad. <laughs> It can be awful, it can be life-changing, it could be life-threatening, it could destroy, it could damage. It's terrible stuff. And James pulls that illustration out saying, hey, if you have a spring, is it gonna at some point just spit out good water and other times spit out bad water? That's craziness. Either it's good or it's bad, and it doesn't flip between the two. Do you get his illustration there? You can't get the same, you can't get two different types of water from the same opening. He continues his illustration. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. The important thing with this verse is that he uses the exact same word for the bad water as for envy and self-seeking, and that word is bitter. 
If I had to summarize envy and self-seeking in one word, I would simply summarize it as self. It is our self that makes ourselves bitter. It's toxic, if I could just put it that way. It makes people gag. When we do something for our own selfish interest and we ignore how other people feel or the things that they're going through or their needs. Now, it may not seem so bad to us when we do it, but to the other person, it can affect them for years. Um, I wanna tell a story about a coat like this. This is a wool coat. It is made partly from a sheep, I'm sure, or at least the wool of a sheep. And what happened was when I was little, I'm guessing like eight or 10, my mom, like to take me with wherever she needed to go shopping, she would take me with. She'd wake up at six o'clock in the morning to the grocery store. I'd go with her because I was a mama's boy. I liked to be with her. And so one day we went to a clothing store and in the clothing store, uh, my mom was looking through these different coats and she told me that she was allergic to wool. And it's like, oh, really? I got to see this. So I went and I found a wool coat on the rack and I bring it to my mom for her to try on. And she looks at me, it's like, Jensen, is that a wool coat? And I'm like, yes. (laughs) And she didn't say another word. She just walked away. And it hit me what I had just tried to do. I literally wanted my mom to break out in hives just to satisfy my curiosity. That's terrible. That's awful. But you know what? My mind had no, it did not even make the connection between me trying to curse my mom with wool and my selfish interest. I had no thought about the danger that I was putting her in. I just cared about myself. It's like, this could be interesting. (laughs) But I didn't think at all about the consequences. You know, my mom never said anything about that, but I honestly wonder how much I hurt her with that. To see her own son be so stupid. Yeah, you can laugh. It was dumb. I mean, I know I've done other things to my mom that could be like a knife to her heart, simply because I didn't think about them. Self is the poison that affects other people. When we do things for ourselves without thinking about other people's good, it's bitterness. And that's James's illustration. We naturally are impure springs. We naturally do not care about other people. We naturally have our own interests at heart and forget everyone else. And that was a small picture of that lesson I learned on that day when I offered my mom this coat. Now, James continues. He says, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure. And then that purity opens a door. Then it's peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality, without hypocrisy. I didn't put that there. Purity is what opens the door to the blessings that God has in store for us. And if a bitter spring, an impure spring, is this ugly word here, then purity is simply doing this. Maybe I can put this another way. We talk about the idea of perfection. Have any of you heard that word before, perfection? Perfection is not so much about what you are capable of. Perfection is a lack. Perfection is a lack of self. 
Because if there is no self in you, you're not going to hurt anyone. You're going to be sweet and helpful, willing to yield, full of good fruits, full of blessings. There's a quote I once saw, and it came to mind. Perfection is achieved not when there is nothing more to add, but when there is nothing left to take away. Do you realize it would be terrible for us to be perfect based on what we could do? Like, you must be this smart to be perfect, or you must be this capable to be perfect, or you must have this job to be perfect. That's a really depressing way to go through life because God has not given us all the same capabilities. And that would be really cruel of God to say, you're not good enough, but then it's like, but God, you never gave me the ability to be good enough in the first place. So God doesn't use that standard at all. The standard he uses is how empty of self are you? Are you pure? Do you have bitterness in you that afflicts other people who are near you? When that is taken away, that's perfection. Sorry, I'm getting a little emotional. I appreciate this verse. Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. People that have the Holy Spirit will know what I'm about to say, how true it is in their lives. A big part of your spiritual awakening comes when you realize the damage that you do to other people. When suddenly you're able to step outside of yourself and you see the things that you have done to other people and you realize that this is a plague in your life and needs to be taken away. It's when you're able to see self for the damage that it actually does. And it's not this immediate thing. I started to learn that lesson when I tried to give my mom that coat. But over time, you realize more and more that our selfishness is what hurts other people. Now, that's not something that we can get rid of ourselves. It's simply not possible. We're born selfish. God has to give that. There's no place in this world that is simply magic. Thank you. That's appreciated. There's no place in this world that you can be at and suddenly be cured of self. It doesn't apply to Washita Hills. It doesn't apply to the Holy Land. It doesn't apply to Mecca. Not even heaven itself can cure a person of self. But we are given space and time here to come close to God and to see our defects and to want those defects to be healed. And that's a journey that nobody can make for you. It's a journey that you yourself need to start. And it's a journey that you yourself need to connect with God to continue and to finish until the very last day. And, you know, I feel like a hypocrite saying these things because I am just like every person I'm looking at. I'm also walking on that journey, and I also make mistakes. Um, But my experiences and the experiences that God has given me can help me to see that other people here are struggling with that journey, too. And it's my prayer that God helps each of us on that journey. I believe it is time to gather in groups, little groups, big groups, I'm not sure which, and ask God for what you think you need.